All right, Andy, you know, you're a huge DC Comics fan as judging by the background <laughs> of your of your uh, of your um of your room of your studio. Uh do you remember when Tyler had first come to you with the uh project for Dark Knight's Death Metal soundtrack in the Sonic Metalverse? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of joked that this was the first time that I was actually officially allowed to be Batman in my head canon. I've been pretending to be the character for all 30 years of my life, but uh I it was so we had just gotten the word that the tours were postponed, that the touring industry had shut down. This is very early in the in the pandemic. And it was that kind of floating period where, you know, none of us knew what was safe to do, what we could do, trying to find a creative outlet. And I got a call. Essentially, I had kind of had a, built a, a small relationship with DC over the years just due to my kind of pretty overt Batman fandom. I had done some collaboration work with them for the 75th anniversary of Batman with Hot Topic and um, yeah, kind of threw it out there. If there's ever something that uh, I could get more involved in, let me know. And so I got a call from uh, Tyler Bates, who at the time I didn't know at all. I knew of him, of course, and I'm a big fan. Um, and I first time we talked, I, I joked that I was staring at the Watchmen soundtrack vinyl on my wall while I was talking to him. But uh, he just said, you know, I'm putting together this animatic series uh for the book and you know there's going to be a music offshoot and other things and would you be interested in playing batman and uh you know for me the the answer was a, a pretty resounding yes so then it became this kind of fun thing that i got to do where early on i'm sitting in this room in my studio uh recording my voice as batman and finding what my batman voice would be and then as things started to kind of the restrictions became more clear i started being able to go to Tyler's home studio and record there. And um, yeah, it was just a, not only was it a dream to be able to play the character, but it was a really necessary creative outlet in a, in a kind of crazy time um, to have an opportunity to, to do this was uh, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. Well, Tyler was saying that you were one of the biggest just fonts of DC Comics information on this entire project. Like you just like your fandom was so informative and everything. Do you remember what your gateway was into DC Comics and more specifically the Dark Knight? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, as a little kid, obviously, I was a kid when the, the, the Burton movies and then the Joel Schumacher movies and all those things were coming out. So that was an impetus for me to get involved in the character. My first Batman movie experience was Batman Returns. Uh, and then when Forever came out, I was the perfect age to be obsessed with everything forever oriented. But uh, from a comics perspective, we had a small comic shop near my house that I grew up at. And my dad would, you know, work late some nights and he'd come home sometimes and bring me a comic book. And the first book that I had was uh, the introduction of the Azrael suit uh, for Jean-Paul Valley as Batman. And I actually had that tattooed on my arm is the, the cover of, of that uh, book where it was a, it was a flip uh, foil cover where you flipped it and it was the old Batman, the traditional Batman, and then the new suit. And so weirdly, my introduction to the character in the books was Jean-Paul Valley playing Batman. And I just fell in love with the suit and the idea of it. And then through the movies... And obviously Batman the Animated Series, most 90s kids have some level of enjoyment with the character just because it was so it was so pervasive in all of pop culture. Um, but for me, it just connected on a level that it never really stopped. And so it became just a deep, deep obsession of mine. And to this day is something that um, whether it's, you know, a source of information for just my the way that my mind works of liking liking to collect knowledge or historical information about the character's derivations or um, when it comes to writing I often reference different things I found in comics when it comes to songwriting or creating my own characters it's been hugely impactful for me for my whole life well you know you like you said in your head canon you've been you've been Bruce Wayne or the Cape Crusader for some time when you're approaching it and I understand it's within the realms of a concept album but what was your own kind of personal insight and mark that you wanted to leave on such an icon you know, I mean, again, because of maybe because of my age range, um, Kevin Conroy's voice has always been the voice of Batman. Um, and so the difficult thing was to not do a Kevin Conroy impression and to try to to find what my own Batman voice would be, because um, I wanted to be able to lend something to the character that felt like it fit within the context of what we know the character to be, but also still sound enough like me that I'm not doing an impression of somebody else. Um, and so that was probably the most exciting thing was to 
find my Batman voice and to go through stylistically go through different things and try to figure out what it would be that my Batman would sound like. But I mean, it's such an interesting book and in the, in the concept of, you know, just a, a myriad of different Batmans in different eras and being in this multiverse situation where you've got different planes of existence and all these different representations of the character. Uh, it was a lot of fun getting to watch all that play out and see how my character or my characterization of, of Batman as the, the traditional, you know, Bruce Wayne, Earth One Batman, uh, how that played in with Dark Side Batman and, you know, there's representations of like New Frontiers and all these different eras. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest thing for me was just to be able to lend what I saw as a, a traditional voice styling for the character. Sure. You know, like you were saying, this is your first collaboration with Tyler. Um, I mean, that's the dude that did like the Dawn of the, the Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead. Um, yeah. Did Watchmen, like you were saying. Um, how was it working with him and Maria on the, on, on this uh, record? Well, I mean, it's, it, there's very few instances that you get to work with people who are just, um, and this is not to say that I haven't had the opportunity to work with incredible people, but those moments, and I've had quite a few, fortunately, but those moments where you, um, you walk into a situation and you just know that the people that you're working with are better than you at what they're doing, <laughs> you know, like that is, it is, to me, it's an exciting feeling because it's not to say that um, I don't meet a lot of people who are better than me, but the moment that you walk into something and you go, this person has a skill set that even if I tried, I couldn't get to. Um, and who they are and what they are as an artist is so uniquely talented and interesting that you can just sort of try to, um, sit back and take in what's there and, and learn some information and learn a, on a collaborative level what you can do to kind of find your own space within it. Um, but being able to work with Tyler and Maria is just, you know, it's a masterclass. It's people that are, that really know what the fuck they're doing and, and are um, just a joy to work with. And so for me in that situation, I'm used to my own kind of world building and, you know, creating characters or, you know, whether it's for comic book series or for records or whatever it is. So to be able to step into something where I'm not, all I'm doing is acting as a vessel for the characters that have already been created and the Sonic world that's already been created. Um, it was a fun experience for me because it was nice to be able to step back and just be a part of something as opposed to the impetus for kind of the the start of something. Well, you know, and you know, and speaking of your experience with world building, you've done comic book work before, right? Like you've diversified into comics with like Z2 with Black Veil mm -hmm. and everything. You know, what do you find personally kind of fulfilling and creatively fulfilling about working in the comic book medium that you can't quite maybe get across like on stage or on, on a record? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it, a lot of it just comes down to your interests for me, because that's my point of view, because I've been reading comics since I was so young, I see so much of the world of art through that lens that to be able to work directly within the style that I kind of find myself most relating to um, it's just thrilling. And also, you know, we talk about Batman, the character who's been around for 80 plus years at this point, and all those different iterations of that character are legitimate. You can point to the Adam West version of the character, and you can point to the Frank Miller Dark Knight Returns version of the character, wildly different, but are both valid versions. So the thrill is, especially with what we're working on now with the Blackbird and the Phantom Tomorrow series that, that we're doing um, with Incendium, that is an opportunity to create a character that you can kind of put through time. You can have these different eras and iterations. And part of the joy of creating a comic book character is to have this thing that's unstuck from time. Music, regardless of whether you're, the best effort that you have is to try to make something that's timeless. That's what everybody wants. But ultimately, it's going to be a product of when it was released. Regardless of whether you listen to something 30 years from when it comes out uh, or, or whatever, you, you say, wow, that still really holds up. That's great. It's still a record that came out 30 years ago. In the capacity of uh, comic book characters, the character and the iconography of the character, particularly the most successful ones, exist throughout time and are maybe the stories feel antiquated because you're looking at, you read a comics code era Batman where he's a zebra or whatever, you go, okay, this is kind of hokey. But the character remains Batman, and Batman exists today. You can drive to a comic shop and pick up a current Batman story, and it is the same character in those different versions. Um, whereas, and again, a musician and, and music is the thing I most closely identify with, but 
a record that was done by a band 40 years ago and a record that was done by the band today, they're different bands. They may have the same name and everything else, but their lives, they are real people whose lives have changed and their circumstances have changed and their abilities have changed. With a fictional, uh, fictitious character like Batman or Superman or anybody else, they have not been burdened by reality. So they exist in their own plane and can be placed in different eras and times in different validities. To that point, I mean, this, and this isn't necessarily just true of just metal, but I feel like it's especially evident with metal. What do you think it is about metal that lends it so, itself so well to like lyrical storytelling? Well, I mean, the, the, you know, for lack of a better term, what people call epic, right? The, the fact that you have, particularly like power metal and these other genres where it is the goal is to make something that sounds massive and the symphonic elements of metal that some people don't necessarily understand are hugely important you know uh maybe somebody listens to metallica and doesn't understand how symphonic that is and how how the structure of those songs lend themselves so well to these kind of large-scale storytelling and world building um you know, there's more overt things. Ronnie James Dio, you're going to go, okay, I get it. I know that this is about dragon slaying and everything else. But in many cases, just the the i the idea of heavy metal or hard rock is in itself so operatic and and larger than life. And also, on just a personal level, those of us who feel um, in some way like we are outcasted from society or that we don't fit in in different places those things are part and parcel. These fantasy worlds and this kind of um, finding a way to get out of the drudgery of the life that you exist in on the, the real plane of life, to be able to find a world to escape into, exists in heavy metal, it exists in comic book collecting, action figure collecting, whatever it is, wrestling, those are all things that have this kind of escapism to them. And I think that that is what brings these things together in a unique way, because if the world outside doesn't understand, it doesn't matter because this world that I can live in and read in and be about uh, is a place for me to feel comfortable and safe. I'm going to put you on the spot a bit. You had mentioned the movies, you had mentioned the animated series. What are some of your, like, you're stuck on a desert island. What are your go-to Batman comic book stories? Um, you know, it's, it's actually interesting because I've been revisiting a lot of older stories that I hadn't read in years. Like I hadn't read Hush, the complete Hush in, in a long time. And I've been going through that and I kind of forgot how just awesome that whole storyline is. And it's also like, I love stories that take a character that's, and spoilers here, but that take a character that you don't associate as one of the top tier rogues gallery. Like, you know, I guess maybe I'm wrong here, but I would never see Riddler as top tier. And a story like Hush makes them so, um, you know, not only like a a real threat, but something that is up in that top tier. So I'm always a fan of those kind of storylines. Um, for a personal, as I, I mentioned before, Nightfall, Night's End, Night Quest, uh, they're all important to me on just a personal level. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that because there's so many books in those, you could probably, you could live off of those. But I also really enjoyed in like the early 2000s when you got into the, the Red Hood series and bringing back Jason Todd, um, yeah, I, I, I would say if I had to pick two, it would be all of the Nightfall series and then Batman Hush would be my favorite Batman story. Phenomenal choice. I'm going to, I'm going to change my mind after we're done with this, by the way. I'm going to go, oh, damn it. Yeah. Long Halloween, golly. But the, oh, fuck yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's my I mean, <laughs> Dark Victory. I mean, I literally have in, a, in our living room in our house, we have a, a framed Long Halloween concept sketch. So, I mean, I, I should have said that, right? <laughs> <laughs> the um uh, just to, i think i got time for one more andy just to close this out like you know what are you stoked about now that the record's out and now that you're about to hit the road with you know your collaborator on this project with maria yeah it's uh it just is this it's this incredible feeling of oh now i get to do the thing that i'm supposed to do you know it's, it's sort of this weird thing where as a musician particularly somebody who's been doing it for a long time for the last 12 13 years of my life i have spent eight, nine months of the year on the road, playing shows, connecting with people in a one-to-one -one way. Um, and then it's just gone. And so then you figure out kind of how to reassemble your creative life in some way. And so now the fact that you kind of, it's almost like being able to exhale. It's, it's exciting to be able to go back to the thing that is the most inspiring and the most, uh, I believe, unique part of being in a, in a, a band or as a musician. Other art forms, a comic book, whatever it is, can add to something after the fact but it's always going to be that thing 
you know, if I do a painting and I decide I want to add something to that painting, it's still the same painting. It's just more added to it. Whereas with live music in any genre, if you're playing a show in Milwaukee, you can change a melody, you can change set list, you can change structure, you can do whatever you want. And that Milwaukee show is its own entity. Well, the next night in Chicago, you can change it all again. And that becomes its own entity. So th as an art form, live music is this unique fluid thing that it, it, it lives and breathes and has a real feeling to it. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to getting back to that level of connectivity on, on a daily basis.